you. This is a celebrity city down there today, isn't it? Uh, tell us who's there and uh, tell us uh, what's been going on. Some of the people that you've seen, the president, what was it like? I actually, all I saw was Walter Cronkite right beside I, I, I me. I was just going to say, busy. that's right. Walter Cronkite been sitting there all day. That would have been enough for me. And, uh, of course, the president. Uh, the president of the United States was here. There was some concern about the president coming, quite frankly, with all the members of Congress as well. And uh, for that matter, 3,700. 30, think of that. 3,700 members of the media there for the launch. You see, there you see the president and uh, the first lady watching the launch. The last time a president came to a launch, it was Apollo 12. That was in 1969. And they launched right into a thunderstorm. Now, a lot of people have looked back on that and said, uh, you know, did they make a hasty decision because Nixon was there watching the Apollo 12 launch. I was talking to Alan Bean about that earlier, who was on that rocket as it rode in and was hit by lightning. The power went out. It went to backup batteries. They had to bring the batteries back up. It was very unclear, very dicey proposition. One clear whether they would have to uh, abort and come right back to Earth. I asked him if he thought that that was uh, something that was, you know, driven by PR as opposed to uh, prudence. And he says no one had ever thought about lightning hitting a rocket until that point. And of course, a rocket would be a tremendous uh, lightning rod. And uh, with that, not only is it tall, but that whole trail of gas behind it is ionized, which means it's electrically charged. And so lightning would go right to it. So uh, NASA learned a scientific lesson, but I think they might have also learned a PR lesson on it, that it one. It was like a flying uh, lightning rod, huh, Miles? Exactly, exactly. It made uh, Ben Franklin's kite look like uh, nothing. <laughs> All right, Tim, you have a question for Miles. Uh, Mr. O'Brien, I was just wondering what it was like to actually interview the president. Well, he was, uh, it was nice. It was nice. It's just uh, in the course of uh, doing business, you run in uh, this business, you run into people uh, high and mighty and not so high and mighty. And uh, it was nice to have him participate in our program. He seemed like he was genuinely enthused about the uh, space program, which is good to hear because it's uh, the kind of program which oftentimes has difficult... Uh, a difficult time selling itself when it comes time to for Congress to vote budgets. It's an easy thing, quite frankly, to cut because uh, it's looked upon in some quarters as kind of frivolous. So the fact that he came here, uh, well, I think, was a good thing for the space program. Certainly the uh, workers here, some 14,000 of them, uh, were feeling uh, as if they had a show of support. You know, Miles, I think that sitting next to uh, Walter Cronkite was all you needed today. The president uh, couldn't, couldn't reach up to that, huh? Well, that really is, the, that was uh, the thrill of a career, Roger. I can't, I can't uh, really, uh, that's, that's uh, hard to, to beat, to be able to sit there with Walter Cronkite. I remember back in uh, 1964 uh, watching uh, the Gemini 4 mission, which was the first U.S. spacewalk. I remember it because uh, Ed White, the man who did that, was my favorite astronaut. Uh, for some reason, I don't remember at this time. Of course, he subsequently died in the Apollo 1 fire in 1967. Nevertheless, I remember so distinctly looking at, you know, uh, I had a 14-inch black and white TV in our house, and there was tin foil on the rabbit ears, and, and there was Walter Cronkite telling me all about space. And uh, to be able to sit next to him and cover this launch was uh, just, it, there's no way to describe it. It's a total thrill. All right, I have a question for Dr. Gaffney. Dr. Gaffney, you were a, a cardiologist and were a cardiologist when you flew in the Columbia mission. Right. Why did they choose a physician to go up as opposed to a scientist or a, a regular scientist rather than a, phys a medical scientist? Well, the, the flight that I went on was specifically to study uh, physiology. And so there were actually uh, three physicians on that flight. All of us, to varying degrees, had been doing research, as, as I do now at Vanderbilt. All right. Miles, uh, I'm going to send it back to you for a conference. Uh, all right. Uh, wrong interruption, uh, wrong uh, information. Let's go. Do we have another question here? I'm sorry. Um, Demira, you have a question. I'd like to know what kind of diet, if any, were the astronauts on uh, while they're in space and even before they launched? All right. Dr. Gaffney, do you hear that question? Yes, I did. A uh, question about diet. Um, usually what they do, if, if the person, as Senator Glenn, is participating in experiments, uh, he'll have worked out in advance with the experimenters and with the dietitians a uh, compromise between what he that? wants to eat and what meets the needs of the experiments. And then over the months of training, you get to try out all the different foods, and you make out a menu for the whole mission, every meal, every day. And uh, they keep track of that, they know what's in it, and they can use that uh, as part of the experiment. Doc, how is that food? Uh, actually, uh, my favorite are the, is the shrimp cocktail, made in Houston, uh, from shrimp from the bay. It's spicy, it's delicious. All right. All right, let me interrupt you a second. Miles, we understand there's a conference coming up. I'm gonna throw it right over to you. This. Oh, Let's you've got the food. This. That's the shrimp right there. There it is. <laughs> Isn't that look delicious? Miles, how do, they, how do they prepare that? 
Well, uh, gosh, it takes a lot of work, I'll tell you. They dehydrate this stuff. And the reason they dehydrate it is it makes it lighter to go into orbit. Now, you may ask, well, you've got to bring the water, right, to rehydrate it? Well, actually, what happens is that the power generators on the shuttle are called fuel cells. I don't know if you remember Apollo 13. Anybody who remembers that story knows what a fuel cell is. It takes liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen to make electricity. What's the byproduct of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen? Water. So you add the water to the food, which looks just delightful here, and uh, you get yourself a nice shrimp cocktail. Now, this is by far and away the most popular meal on board the shuttle. All seven crew members up there have shrimp cocktail on their menus uh, all throughout the mission. And um, I don't know, to me, it looks like something the dog would leave on the carpet for now. But I, uh, <laughs> anyway. All right. I, I don't know what this says about all the other food that's up there on that uh, space mission, <laughs> if that's.